Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cisco Optics Podcast, where we talk about optics for networking. What are the industry's technical experts and pluggable optics thinking about today? What are the technical boundaries that the smartest minds are pushing past to make the next generation of high-speed optics? If you're wondering about this, we have just the person for you. This is episode eight, where we continue a conversation with my esteemed colleague, Mark Noel. Dr. Noel is a Cisco fellow, and for good reason. In my eight and a half years at Cisco, I've known him to be a highly respected and influential leader, not only at Cisco, but the entire optics industry. In this final part of our four-part conversation, we continue talking about thermal considerations, which he's been thinking and writing about lately. We also discuss a useful white paper on the QSAPDD website, which provides detailed design guidelines. Mark Noel is a Cisco fellow in Cisco's Optics and Optical Systems Group. His focus is on next generation interconnect technology innovation to meet Cisco's needs. Mark is also active within the industry standards and forums and has chaired multiple IEEE 802.3 Ethernet projects. He represents Cisco on various industry alliances and consortiums. Mark also chairs a number of industry multi-source agreement groups, focusing on next-generation optical module form factors such as QSP-DD and QSP-DD-800, and optical interface signaling technology like the 100G Lambda MSA. What has Mark not done? If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast. It may show up as the Cisco Podcast Network, which has other great podcast series as well. Check out our blog at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics Blog, all one word, no hyphen and no spaces. For our YouTube playlist, go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. And for product information, go to cisco.com slash go slash optics. And now, join me as I talk with Mark Noel. When you were driving the 400 gig QSAP DD MSA, you had to think about the mechanical design a lot, right? And the thermal consequences. How how did you take into account all the various system level variability, right? Because there are lots of different routers and switches out there. They don't all blow the air the same way, the same direction, or maybe the same rate. And then even then, like when when they get deployed, uh, I don't know, are there different temperature standards at different uh, facilities in terms of the air temperature, like ambient? There, there are, and, and that, that is a problem and it's a challenge. So the, the thing with the, you, know, you create this form factor and, and that, that's great that you know everyone builds the same form factor and then as a system designer we're able to go and customize around that figure out how are we going to go put as many as we want and how are we going to cool them and then we also have to factor into that what is the operating environment that a customer may deploy it um and and so it, you're, you're correct that it, it is it is very different and you know service service sorry service providers have um, very well laid out uh, environmental requirements, you know, where they may put these things in different uh, altitudes and, and, you know, what the ambient temperature in the room might be and uh, where there's a hot aisle and where there's a cold aisle and things like that. Um, the data centers, the web scale data centers were solving this problem and a much bigger problem set. And, and so they, there's, there's a lot more uniformity there, um, but I think they've recognized that you know the the requirements in terms of the ambient temperature that we run our equipment is is more controlled and more reasonable um, within the data centers than than some of the service provider uh, requirements that used to exist. So I think I, I, as an industry, it's kind of becoming a bit more normalized now. But um, yeah, we we've we've seen we're typically designing for a, a lower ambient temperature than we used to. Um, what 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 is the reason for, when you say it's becoming more normalized, do you mean that like service providers and data center people are coming together now and realizing well, they need to unify? I, I, think, I think it's different equipment in different places, right? So where you're putting in the really high density 
where thermals around optics is such a problem are tend to be the big facilities now. Um, and, and so there, things are a bit more environmentally controlled. Um, and uh, sort of the, the, the problem the service provider operators have is, is they, they, they're just huge, graphically diverse. They, they just have to put equipment where people are in, in cities or in rural areas. And, and so they maybe have less control over the temperatures in some of those buildings um, or where they're, you know, if you're in Colorado, it's at a different altitude than if you're in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, but typically they're not maybe putting in the massively high density equipment in the, in the same uh, quantity that you know, a web scale data center would have. So it's, you know, there's different equipment doing different things. So, you know, it allows as a system designer, we can build that equipment to accommodate those. I see. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the bigger challenge is really when we're trying to cram it all in together and, and get it just, you know, the, the high density stuff for the web scale. So that's, that's where most of the attention has been. So, so, so what's the result of all this attention? What, what's the state of the art today in terms of cooling pluggable options? Um, well, it, as, as I mentioned, it, it's, uh, you know, this has been huge innovation around what we do around these optical modules. Um, actually, the QSP double. I'll just put a shout out to the to the MSA. Um, we just published a white paper. So there's a QSP double density MSA. I can't remember the QSP dash DD dot com or something. Uh, there's a white the thermal white paper. Anyone who really wants to go in and 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 get more detail than, than they ever wanted. There's a good white paper that, that we just published with a lot of these details, but I can, um, I can put it in the notes of the podcast. Okay. No, that, that'd, that'd be great. Work. And you know, we, we kind of broke it down into, into two areas is, is what can you do inside the module? And then there's, what can you do outside the module? And, and, uh, I think what, what we realized because we were running into a lot of challenges, um, yeah, not challenges. We, we were seeing a lot of uh, variability coming from the module designers. And so different module uh, architectures were performing better than others. And so it, it, a lot of it came down to understanding what, from a thermal perspective, what made things operate better. And it, it really is about ensuring you've got a very low I, I say low impedance, which means that, you know, the, the flow of, of, of thermal energy is, is as the least resistance, right? So to, how can I get the heat that's being generated from my laser or from my DSP chip? How can I get it to the top surface of my module as efficiently as possible? And it's just things like putting in thermal interface materials in your module or, or just worrying about things like the thickness of your, of your, um, uh, of the case material, uh, the thinner you make something, the harder it is for heat to flow through it. And so there's there's a whole bunch of techniques that you can go do to just to increase your ability to get the heat to the surface of the module. And then we also um, innovated a little bit where you know we didn't want to attach a heat sink to the module inside because we had to have that backwards compatibility. But we found that if we just actually put a, a heat sink on the nose of the module that sits on the outside, the air does actually go through that. We, you know, cause it's getting pulled into the equipment. The air is getting pulled in. If it goes through the, the nose heat sink, that allows some dissipation of, of the heat um, before the air even comes inside the equipment. Sorry, can you back up a second and just kind of describe, I know, I don't, we don't have visuals at our disposal, but can you maybe describe in words like the shape of the module, the nose that you mentioned? Yeah. So, so I mean, an optical module is just really a little rectangular square box, right? And it's a little metal square box at one end. It's got a, an electrical connector, which is really just the edge of the card. And that, that plugs into the back of the, uh, inside the inside the um, the system and then at the front of the module you have this is that sticks out of the faceplate is that's the nose 
and that's where the optical connector that's where you attach your patch cord okay. and, and, and the, amount and the of, earlier earlier modules like sap sap plus there really wasn't a nose that you just you plug it into the port and it kind of disappears into the port right I mean, there's a little bit of a nose. Well, yeah, there's, there's, it has to be something because you have to be able to get your fingers in to yeah. put the patch cord in. And and the QSOP is the same. And, and the problem I was describing at the beginning about how do we fit all this into a 400 gig module, um, all of the optical module companies came back and said, hey, we're really, it, uh, that's not a lot of space in there for all this new technology. Can we push that? nose can we extend that nose out a little bit further mm -hmm. to give us a bit more space inside the module and and so as an industry we kind of looked at that and said yeah that, that makes a lot of sense um and so that's and, and we call that within the qsp we call that type one which is the old way the shorter one and type two which is is the longer nose and so modules that don't need the space they don't have to use that extension it doesn't matter it doesn't affect the interoperability at all it's still the same port in the equipment and, and what i was describing so that nose is now sticking out of the module what we found is if if you have a very very high power module you can actually go and attach a heat sink to that and it just comes as part of the module so it's it's no different but um just by putting a, a heat sink, meaning the fins or heat uh, sink is is just fins. Yeah, when I when I talk okay. about a heat sink, it, it's just it's a piece of metal that's shaped, so it has it has fins that the air goes by, and you're just trying to increase the surface area, so that you know air will transfer, heat will transfer from from metal to air, and the more metal there is, the more it'll transfer, the more surface and, area there is. And if it's a front to back airflow switch a router, then the router takes care of drawing the air from the ambient environment through, yes, yes. through, that, so through most, the ends of the nose. Most equipment these days now is is all built so that it, it's fans at the back of the equipment and it's just sucking the air from the front. So everything comes in through the face plate of the equipment. Um, and you know, so we have these fans sucking, it creates a negative pressure and that just draws the air in um, and, and, the, and it pulls it through the, the nose as well. You know, if, if there's a heat sink on the nose, it just pulls the air through through that as well. So you're already transferring heat off the module before it even comes into the equipment. Is that is that direction required? Um, or like say a 20 watt module or? Uh, I think I think it depends on the density. I think a lot of um, a lot of equipment, uh, especially on the server side, that the fans are reversible, so you can either have them drawing you know air into the faceplate or or pushing air out of the faceplate, and it really customers it depends on how they configure. It. And some some customers would like all their cables hidden and and in the back, um, so they just turn the equipment around and then turn the fan around uh, accordingly. Um, I'm, I'm not, most of the equipment that I am familiar with for these higher powers is all pulling it into the faceplate. Yeah, I mean, um, if if at 400 gig, if the main heat sources are at, at the front faceplate, face plate, what reason would there be not to have front back flow? You would think that that would be the natural design. Yes, yeah, and I, for for the high density boxes, um, you know, I'm just I'm being hesitant because I, I I'm sure there's a, a use case where you would want to have the optics of the back and have the cabling coming out of the back of the equipment, and you would turn the the you change the fan directions and push it out the front. But I don't think it would be on equipment where you'd maybe have 32 ports. Um, I'm sure someone will prove me wrong, but you know, you know, it, it's definitely easier on the on the cooling of the optics to have it being drawn in, you know, having the cold air from yeah. outside hitting the optics yeah. first, because we then have to cool whatever's behind the optics, and we generally have a very high power ASIC back there as well. So, mm. I mean, the thermal design of the systems is is very complex. Figuring out how to deal with all this preheated air and keep your ASIC 
um, and th and then cool. you also have to make sure that it's like within the aisles of your data center or something, right? Do you make sure right. that it's not a hot aisle that you're drawing in? Yeah. So the the the, the network operators will they'll lay out their equipment uh, a certain way, and and typically they they would either have yeah they they would they would not have you pulling any any air into your equipment which has been preheated by some other equipment so it, it could be you know back to back so there you got this hot aisle cold aisle thing and there's and there's a lot of innovation at the data center environmental level of how they how they do that and how they build the buildings and keep them cool hmm. hey getting back to that white paper that's on the uh the msa website right is that something that I guess people in the industry can, can use as sort of like a design guide. Yeah, that, that, that was, was the intention. intention. That, that was the intention because there, there's a lot of um, a lot of noise in, in the in the system around, you know, can these things be cooled? And, you know, and, and what we realized, um, you know, from a Cisco point of view, and when we went and talked to a bunch of other companies is, you know, we've been we've got a massive amount of experience on, on solving these issues. And that's why we were fairly confident that we could do the QSP DD. Um, but we need everyone to be able to do it in order to have interoperability and have, you know, create that economies of scale. Right. And so, so it's a standard and you're trying to get everybody, all the players. Exactly. Right. And so, standard, right. you know, this white paper, yeah, I think it was about five or six companies all got together and there were some module companies and connector companies and system companies all coming together and, and comparing notes on on how would we, you know, explain all this and using our various different uh, expertises. And, and so it was really to just kind of push some knowledge out into the industry that, you know, how you would approach doing these things. Um, okay. You know, we, we can't control who's going to be building the equipment. And, you know. So I think you described it to an extent. Can you just sort of recap what's what's in the white paper? What does it cover? Well, it covers it covers two things. It covers what's, you know, some of the, and it's really just meant to be, you know, here are the three or four different things you can go do. And, and it gives you some ideas to what works there, what works there. So we concentrated the white paper on, how to optimize things within the module. And that was the first bit we, we talked about. And we didn't talk about the second part, which is really a, what can you do at a system level um, to maximize how do you cool these modules? So you've got them and you hope the module designer has, has done a good design to get the heat to the surface of the module. And then your job as a system designer is to get that heat away and keep that case temperature down. And, and so the, you know, a lot of, you know, the innovation I was talking about is, is captured in, in this white paper, but it's all about how do you customize heat sinks within these cages? How do you customize the cage design itself? So before, as I said, it was like these kind of coffins that you would slide these modules into and they were just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, little ovens and heat up. Now we've got these cages where they're, they're, really opened up so the air flows through them um, we, we we embed heat sinks inside the cages because it's often a within a cage there's there's what we call a stack cage so there's two of them there's an upper and a lower port and that lower port is is getting cooked because it's got a something above it that's generating heat and, and there's no air going through it so how do you open up that um open up the cage so the air flows through the cage you put heat sinks um, within the cage and, and on top of the cage and and then how do you actually put these in your equipment how do you space them you you can maybe um, turn them sideways there's a whole bunch of different techniques that you can go and do and, and the, the beauty that we have have come to appreciate more is that QSFP double density design, which we thought was um, a, a drawback because it was small and it was flat topped, turns out to be um, a, a boon because because it's flat topped, 
as a system designer or a cage designer, we have almost an infinite amount of flexibility on what we do there. And so you just plug that thing in and the system designer working with a cage designer, connector designer will have gone and done a bunch of things in their design to guarantee that module stays cool. And, and that's where all the innovation is. And, and that the mere fact that you have a flat top has given us this flexibility to go and, and, and make all these optimizations to allow us to get to these 25 watts. Um, and it's very, very interesting. Yeah. And it sounds like this white paper is going to be a really valuable resource as 400 gig, you know, continues to, to get deployed and designed into systems. Is Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the reason actually it got put together, this, this, this wasn't our first white paper that the MSA put out, but um, we're now looking ahead and, and looking at 800 gig and all of the same challenges and motivations exist where it'd be really nice to stay in the same form factor and oh my gosh we're going twice as fast how do we fit all that in and how do we cool it all um and and so there was again uh, sort of like hey is this is this going to be possible and and the conclusion we came to is absolutely right we you know we looked at all the what we think is the maximum power we're going to see for an 800 gig optics and again it's that that long haul coherent optics and so we're saying that's you know we use 25 watts as that target um and and we went through the exercise of proving out through experiment and through simulation that it was perfectly feasible to cool that um and you know our own work internally i think 25 isn't isn't the max at all hmm. but but okay. it, it, it's just interesting you know i i I sometimes step back and say, wow, this was a three and a half watt device. And and now we're doing so much out. more. You squeezed out so much from this it, tiny, little, yeah, it's, tiny little it, uh, rectangular box. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So so what is the state of this, this 800 gig uh, MSA at yeah. this point? Uh, well, 800 gig is... Um, so the, the MSA is, so the, uh, the QSP DD MSA, uh, actually a second MSA got generated called QSP DD 800. Um, it's got its own website, right? It's got its own website. And, Which I, and, I can find it and put it in the notes. And there's a spec there, but I, I would, depending on when uh, anyone listens to this, um, what I would do is just revert them back to the QSP DD website because what we did is we took that 800 gig spec and we handed it back to the um qsbd uh msa and they've incorporated oh. that into their spec so there's there's just oh, gonna okay. be one one spec it's gonna, gonna have the 400 gig module it's gonna have the 800 gig module um it will also have uh what many people would know of as qsfp 112 so that's a 400 gig module with only the um uh, four, channels. four four channels on the electrical side. So the, all of those will be in, and you know, so it's it's March when we're talking now, and I would say in the mm -hmm. next four to six weeks that's going to be published. Okay, um, I think this this podcast will get published starting probably around that time, actually. So yeah, hopefully yeah. it'll all be out there, and and to you know, so the the challenges with eight hundred gig. Um, were the thermals, which, as I, you know, as we've been talking about, I don't think are are a concern. And and on the signal integrity, how do you get this hundred gig electrical signal into this connector? And and that's what the the MSA spec defines. It, it's you know some tweaking and optimizations to the to the connector and the pads, and and all the signal integrity looks really good. And so we're going to be seeing in the not too distant future, we're going to be seeing eight hundred gig modules um most people are going to use them as as uh, a, in a breakout configuration so it'll really be two 400 gig interfaces or eight 100 gig interfaces um but the module itself is has an 800 gigabit capacity with it okay uh the, so the 800 gig sorry did you say they're they're 100 gig channels 
Um, or 50 gig yeah. panels. No, there it's so the 800 gig module has eight 100 gig electrical okay. channels going in, and then coming out, it'll be depending on on which module you use it, it'll probably be uh, two 400 gigabit Ethernet ports, or it'll be eight 100 gigabit Ethernet ports. Okay, um, but in, in breakout mode, you, it it'll, it can connect to the single lambda 100 gig. Yes, yeah, it would be the other end. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And the IEEE is starting its work now on on 800 gigabit Ethernet, um, and that will take its time to to work itself out. Um, but the module's already there. So when we do actually have true 800 gigabit Ethernet optics. Mark, this has been really educational and fascinating. That was the fourth and final part of my conversation with Mark Noel. Make sure to check out the notes section for links to other resources, such as the white paper on the QSAPDD website that Mark mentioned. Subscribe to this podcast, and we'd really appreciate you helping to get the word out. Share this with friends and colleagues that come to mind when you think of network technology and optics. And leave a review on Apple Podcast, formerly known as iTunes. We're also on all the other major podcast platforms. You may see the Cisco Podcast Network come up when you search on Cisco Optics Podcast. That's just where we live, and you can find other great podcasts there too. Also, check out the Cisco Optics blog at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics blog with no spaces and no hyphens in there. We also have educational videos on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. Thank you for listening. This is Pat Chow, Product Manager at Cisco Optics. That concludes my conversation with Mark Noel. Until next time.